yes, start the recording, and then I will just give you the brief introduction to the session and thank all our presenters for being here, and uh, and then we'll get started. Okay. Right. So this is, the, as I said earlier, this is the second of. Uh, um, Eden's webinars uh, in uh, as part of Open Education Week, uh, which runs uh, all week. So today we're going to be talking about open education recognition and credentials, and we have a fantastic panel for you today uh, from uh, Knowledge Innovation Centre in uh, Malta. We have Anthony Camilleri and uh, Ildiko Mazar, um, then um, Chiara Carlino from Chinica. And then uh, we'll wind up with uh, um, Pete Hendricks from EADTU. So we're going to be looking at um, uh, a range of different issues uh, around this question of open education recognition and credentials. Um, we're going to look at the wider European context. We're going to look very concretely at what the um, Erasmus Plus Open Virtual Mobility Project is doing on badges and credentials. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, the common micro-credential framework and linking that as well to work that uh, um, many of us are doing in the ECHO project, which is the European Credit Clearinghouse for Opening Up Education, um, another Euro, um, Euro, uh, Erasmus Plus project, so European project which has recently started and which is looking at this question of um, open education recognition and credentials. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, you can share them in the chat. We'll try and um, uh, respond to you as quickly as possible. We'll take time um, at the end to pick up any questions that, uh, that we might have missed. And um, hopefully you will find this a very, very um, rich and uh, fruitful uh, session. Um, just uh, before we go into the first presentation, I'd like to remind you or give you the information, if you don't already have it, that um, uh, the uh, 29th Eden Annual Conference is taking place in Timisoara in Romania uh, in June. Um, their call for contributions is still open, so you can have a look at the Eden website there, and we hope to see you in Timisoara in June for this, uh, uh, for this event. But moving back to the question of open education recognition and credentials this morning. Um, I think we can get started, and I'll hand over to Anthony Camilleri. So thank you very much. I'm just going to bring up my uh, presentation here. The Secretariat can do that as well. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, actually, this presentation was prepared by myself and Ulde Komazar, but uh, I'll be walking you through it in the interest of saving a little bit of time here. And what we really wanted to do was try and frame the discussion of credentialing within the wider context of the discussion on open education as a whole. And starting off with this, it's good to have a definition of what we mean by open education. Uh, I've chosen one from the JRC report on opening up education. And when you look at this definition, you find a number of terms such as customizable, multiple ways of teaching and learning, multiple ways of building and sharing knowledge, variety of access routes. And all of these parts of the definition of open education tend to lead you to understand that it's something that's supposed to be made up of different parts which you can combine in different ways. Um, and this leads me to a discussion around uh, a typical process model for open education. And here we have input factors, which are based on open educational resources. We look at process factors, which are linked to the discussion on open educational practices. But Currently, our discussion around open education doesn't really talk about the output factors, which are the educational credentials. And what I would like to propose to you in the next 15 minutes is 
that open educational credentials might be the third missing pillar of our open discussion around open education. Now, if we're going to talk about the customizability, customization requires a system of interoperable building blocks. You can think of this as Lego. If you want to build something out of different parts, you need a kind of standardized framework of parts to do this. And because we talk about this system of interoperable building blocks, the discussion around open educational credentials very quickly leads us to a discussion around micro-credentials, which you could think of as these building blocks. And micro-credentials are something that you could say are a type of education that have four characteristics I'll walk you through, being modular, stackable, portable, and digital. Let's start with modularity. So modularity means a few things. First of all, it means that a micro-credential needs to be open access. You need to be able to take a micro-credential on its own and not necessarily only be able to take it as part of a bundle, such as when it's locked up into a degree. Secondly, the modules need a standardized unit of measure. How do you know what a module is if you have no way of describing it or of measuring it? And typically, the, that would be a basic of learning outcomes and of workload and or ECTS. And for it to be a module, it has to be small. Now, there's a lot of discussion on how small it should be, but you could say that 15 ECTS equivalents as a maximum size to be able to still call it a micro-credential. Um, probably when you got above that size, it's something else and maybe a macro or something. Um, second part, is stackability. Now, this awkward word of stackability is not chosen uh, by accident. So there's a difference between combining something, such as when you combine a lot of grains of sand into, well, basically a pile of sand, and actually stacking things where you very carefully lay them on top of one another and where the, where the sum is greater than its parts. So when we're talking about stackability, we would say that a micro-credential is standardized, or at least standardized in terms of format. It can be combined to create larger credentials, and a micro-credential cannot be too small. Again, there's arguments on how small is too small, but let's say one ECTS equivalent as the minimum. Once you go be below that, you get the grain of sand scenario where you can combine, but you can't really stack in a meaningful way. Third part of this is portability. And by portability, we mean that you can carry this credential from one institution to another. So it means when you can carry it from one institution to another, we're also talking about recognition. Recognition for the purpose of access to courses or access to institutions, and recognition for the purpose of stacking credentials from different institutions into greater holes. It also implies that these credentials need to be quality assured because institutions will never accept credentials that are not quality assured. It means that they need to be secured. So the envelope you are carrying them in or the medium you carry these credentials from one institution to another has to be trusted. And they need to be mapped against some kind of framework or harmonized in some kind of way so that you can understand uh, what credentials from different institutions mean. The last part of this equation is digital. Now, you probably ask, why does a micro-credential have to be digital? And technically speaking, it doesn't have to be digital. It's just impractical if it isn't. Um, if you imagine that you have a thousand universities offering 50 courses as micro-credentials each, that gives you 50,000 micro-credentials. If you do the math of how many different five credential combinations is possible, that's two six trillion, according to my calculator. Uh, I have no idea how many zeros two six trillion is. Um, the point of this, though, is that when you're talking about these numbers, digital is the only conceivable way to be able to uh, uh, process this kind of information at scale. So it needs to be digital because you can earn it in any mode. So you can earn a micro-credential in face-to-face -face learning, 
but it needs to be awarded digitally, it needs to be stacked digitally, and it needs to be recognized digitally so that the system is able to scale. So after we understand what is a micro-credential and it's linked to open education, then the question is what's wrong with digital micro-credentials today? And the answer is a lot. Um, credentials still aren't digital, they don't give you enough information, quite often they don't have any validity on the job market, there's a big problem around standardization, and a lot of institutions just still won't recognize them. And we'll go through these one by one. So here's an example of just a credential, and a lot of certificates still look like this. You finish a course, you get a PDF of some sort, or you get, which is effectively just the document you can print. They're not true digital credentials in the sense that they contain information within them that can be computer read. Um, furthermore, when you look at these, there's very limited access to underlying information. So I've done a course on introduction to project management principles and practices. Great. What have I learned on that? To what level have I done this? It says it's a four course on demand specialization. Have I spent six months studying? Have I spent six weeks studying? None of this information is actually embedded within the certificate in a lot of cases. And when this information is not embedded within the certificate, it, it basically means that any employer would have to engage in archaeology to go find the original course description and understand what the certificate actually means or trust my word for it. Third part is that many micro-credentials are not really valid as currencies on a job market. The simple truth of the matter is that 72% of employers spend less than 15 minutes reviewing an application, which means that if they have to go checking what every micro-credential means, they're not going to do it. They're just going to skip to the next job application and discount that information. You say, no problem, we can use artificial intelligence to solve this problem, we can use human resources systems to pre-scan the applications. Well, actually, most Fortune 500 companies do use this kind of software, and when you check with employers, 62% of employers admit that the software filters out qualified candidates, but it doesn't matter because of the efficiency gains they get in processing the applications, they're willing to put up with this error. If you're the person who had your application filtered out, you probably feel a little bit differently. So again, we need better standards to stop this kind of thing happening. And when you look at security and verification, we usually talk about securing things with digital signatures and so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at digital signatures, though, and you just Google digital signatures, and they have nothing against DocuSign, they were just first on my uh, Google search results, you see that you are paying $120 annually for the privilege of a digital signature. So this is something that cost me a 25 cent pen, and now you're asking me for $120 annually to get the same service. And this is because a lot of the standards and the software and the services behind digital signatures are actually closed source. So if you look at the system today, I would argue that of course there are exceptions, but at system level, our system of credentials is currently closed. We have a system of closed credentials, which means that the credentials are expensive and time consuming to acquire. They're hard to use and share, they hinder open education by failing to enable flexible learning pathways. They exclude people from employment opportunities, and quite often the people excluded are the ones which most need those opportunities through features like algorithmic bias and so on and so forth. They can be abused by closed source companies that create that insert themselves as intermediaries to use your credentials, and they do not inform policy. So that said, we have all the pay pieces we need in place to actually create an open credential system today. Um, we have a lot of the tools there, and a lot of the tools existing only need minor modification to actually be able to support open credentialing. So 
Within the EU, at least, through something called the Bologna process, we've spent years creating various recognition instruments. The European Qualifications Framework gives you an indication as to levels of qualifications. The Diploma Supplement gives you a standardized template to describe your degree. The European Credit Transfer System allows you to describe your accomplishments in terms of learning outcome and workload. And the European Skills Competence Qualifications and Occupations Database, usually called ESCO, provides you with a standard terminology and ontology for actually doing this. So you look at this and you say, okay, we have everything we need for credentials. But the fact is that the EQF is only for formal large qualifications. It doesn't apply for non-formal education and micro-credentials. The European Diploma Supplement is a wonderful tool, but again, it's only applied to degrees. ECTS, there's a concept of workload and of learning outcomes, but it's only applied to higher education. And ESCO, even though it's wonderful, isn't actually used by the tools above. That said, you can see the pieces you need to apply these tools for micro-credentials within these tools. So our big little idea in a project called OEPAS was simply enough to create a digital standard format for documenting open education and to base it on the principles of ECTS. In other words, using learning outcomes and using workload and on a standardized template to actually be able to describe micro-credentials. And to do this, we've created something called the Learning Passport. And the Learning Passport is simply enough a document that allows you your learning experience to be documented in terms of awarding body, credential awarded, holder of credential, and evidence. And as I said, the main parts within this are always learning outcomes and workload. The second part of this is technical standardization. And again, there is a big global standard I'm sure you've heard of, which is Open Badges. And Open Badges is sold as a technical standard that would allow for this kind of recognition of and standardization of micro credentials. Uh, Simply enough, though, at least within Europe, even be, though it's been around for over a decade, open badges has not gained a lot of traction in higher education. We could spend an entire webinar arguing why that is, but I would summarize it saying higher education in Europe is a very regulated, very uh, documented system, and open badges may be just a little bit too open to marry well with European regulatory processes. To this end, within another related project, OE Pass and something called MicroHE, we started trying to build a wider data model that uh, would accurately describe micro-credentials in terms of the type of data that is required through European transparency instruments. Um, the point of this is not to lead you to every part of this data model right now, but the point is just to tell you that this takes concepts such as learning outcomes, such as credential types, such as grades, such as qualification framework levels, includes concepts such as accreditation and all the information that goes into accreditation, and applies it down to micro-credential levels. This micro-HE data model has gotten quite a bit of attention and has actually been developed further and integrated into something called the European Framework for Digitally Signed Credentials. And this is the European Commission initiative that will go live across Europe this May and basically allow all institutions to issue credentials and micro-credentials as W3C verifiable claims. And the idea is that this credential format will actually be able to capture anything from a certificate of attendance through to modules such as MOOCs, through to employer recommendations, through to apprenticeship certificates, mobility experiences, and even full degrees, all using a standardized data format based on learning outcomes. So the only difference under this data format between micro-credentials and degrees would effectively be just the level of granularity but it accepts that once you break things down into learning outcomes, it all basically looks the same. The learning model for Europass is available online at GitHub. You can see the URL over there. 
and a, just a quick look at what the future interface will look like when these digital credentials go live as of May. Another part of the problem is this issue I was mentioning about signature and about a signature costing $120 a year and having a whole infrastructure that's based on certain signature providers to secure the credentials. Now, a lot of people will tell you that blockchain will solve this problem because blockchain produces a system of decentralized trust. And since you don't need an intermediary to sign the documents. But the truth is that blockchain is an extremely, extremely young technology. We're still figuring out exactly what it can do and how the applications for this might work. So within MicroHE, we actually have been experimenting with a model blockchain infrastructure for storing and automatically verifying credentials. And what we've actually built is we have built a system on the blockchain that will allow you to issue micro-credentials and combine micro-credentials into larger, let's call them macro-credentials, and register this entire credential lifecycle entirely on the blockchain using something called ERC721 tokens. There's no time to actually walk you through the details of all of this, but Ludico is pasting the links to all of these initiatives as we go. Final part of all of this is recognition. So it's great to have well-documented, it's great to have well-documented credits, secure technology, and so on and so forth, but none of this is useful if institutions refuse to recognize these micro-credentials. And again, within Europe, we have a system for recognizing credits done in another institution, which are called Erasmus Agreements, which are basically contracts between two institutions saying that if a student studies X credit at your institution, I will accept it as if they had studied it at mine. Erasmus Agreements are wonderful, but they only apply to physical mobility, and they only apply to physical mobility done in periods of three to six months. So they're not really done at micro-credentials. So again, in a third project, which Deborah was alluding to, called ECHO, we are piloting semi-automated agreements for microcredit mobility. The idea is to take the general idea of the learning agreement that is uh, done in Erasmus and apply this to micro-credentials. And also to, through something we call a clearinghouse, pilot different ways of partially automating all of this. Because if you have to sign a contract for every micro-credential agreement and do this manually, again, it does not scale. So to allow it for scale, the idea is to have experiment with ideas such as pre-approved lists or pre-approved cooperation agreements covering large numbers of credentials and looking also at other methodologies. You put this all together and what we are working towards across this alphabet soup of different projects, different transparency tools, different recognition tools, is a future where recognition could be universal, automatic, and seamless. Ideally, we want to enable a future where user students can just study whatever you want from wherever you want and not need to worry about how the recognition of this works, you should just be able to know that it will. And to this reason, I'm hoping that I've convinced you that to make all of this happen within the open education thing, it's important that we do put more emphasis on credentialing and that we set a goal of saying the third pillar of open education is open educational credentials. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Anthony, for walking and talking us through that complex environment. Um, obviously, this is from a European perspective, um, and so there was some uh, exchange going on in the chat um, just to clarify certain terms. Um, we have um, time for questions to Anthony in the, in the chat now. Um, if you want to contribute um, examples from outside Europe, that would be great as well. We can collect the, the links and share them amongst, uh, uh, amongst the group or share them openly, saying as we're talking about open 
um, education and open recognition. So um, um, feel free to um, to put any questions in the in the chat. And any silence right now is not awkward silence. It's time to think, to reflect, to digest. Okay, what, what I can say um, while um, questions and comments are coming in uh, through the chat is that um, uh, one of the guiding principles behind the ECHO project, the last project that Anthony mentioned, is uh, to run a series of open consultations. Um, therefore, intermediate results coming from the project uh, will be opened up for um, uh, public peer review. Uh, and so again, if people are, are, are interested, then um, we can uh, we can let you have the information on that. This will be taking place more or less around the the summer, um, but the summer's not that far away. Okay, I'm waiting for another question to come in to the chat, but we're doing well perfectly well for time. Okay, so um, Larissa is uh, sharing um, her own experience in the chat. Thanks for a very comprehensive presentation. I agree that digital micro-credentials are too open for a highly regulated higher education. Um, you tried to introduce it in your university, um, not ready to take digital credentials seriously. Yes, I think uh, from what Anthony was saying, this is the general perception. Um, UOL, which university is that? Ah, University of London, okay. <laughs> Uh, perhaps I can add yes, something please. to that. Do you hear me? Ah, okay, okay. So I can imagine that universities are reluctant to, to introduce micro credentials when you talk about mainstream higher education, so the bachelor and master programs, bachelor programs um, for mainstream students of 18 to 25 years, because the programs are not uh, built in this way. Uh, universities. Uh, 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 use some principles for for building their uh, uh, their, their, their curricula, and uh, curriculum development is an, a discipline on its own, and uh, micro credentials uh, are not, not necessarily uh, fitting into this. Uh, so when you talk to universities, I think they are happy to introduce the, the notion micro credentials when they talk about continuing education, 
and also in some countries about uh, master degrees uh, because uh, like in the UK for example uh, uh, master degrees are uh, increasingly online because master students are uh, often and, and many fold are uh, part-time students uh, this is not a other European countries where it is a full-time study uh, in, in most for most students so from, from the moment that you organize um, education for students who combine their studies with work uh, so um, older students uh, 25 plus students it can be for a master it can be for another degree it can also just be for the micro credential in itself uh, a small piece of study for updating, for upskilling and reskilling, then micro credentials are very useful for universities. And um, when thinking about continuing education, I think micro credentials are, are really uh, very, very uh, uh, useful for universities. And uh, uh, universities are very much motivated to introduce them in their programs, not so much in their mainstream programs. And that's uh, perhaps the program, the, the problem many uh, universities face talking about micro credentials because they, uh, it's not the same as just creating a modular structure uh, for your bachelor or for your master programs. Micro credentials are new qualifications, and I can imagine that they that they are reluctant uh, for creating new qualification for mainstream students also uh, because they fear to to face in that case. Uh, uh, to bring a study progress and uh, study success even in in uh, in danger when this is measured against uh, attaining a bachelor degree. Okay, thank master. you very much, Pete. So um, yes, we have uh, Dominique all with us, who's who's raising um, the the larger issue, uh, which is related to what you've just said um, about uh, formal education, preferring to talk about. Uh, uh, courses um, and, and not um, about skills, knowledge, and abilities. And uh, in in France, where I work, uh, we 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 have this issue uh, where uh, there's a move to um, uh, developing courses around blocks of competences, and this is something that the Echo Project is also looking at: uh, developing credentials around blocks of competences, learning outcomes, if you like. And um, uh, the philosophy in France is that for a formal bachelor's degree, the, the particular block of competences um, uh, is built up over the three years of the bachelor's course. So that seems to be a contradiction with a more modular approach to learning, which would fit um, the continuing education scenario. Um, I don't know if, uh, Anthony, you have anything that you would like to add to this. And while Anthony is perhaps just uh, giving a few concluding remarks, uh, I'm going to ask our colleagues at the Secretariat to switch the presentation so that we're ready to start with uh, um, uh, with Chiara's presentation, which obviously will be looking at um, uh, this notion of competences as well. So, Anthony, any closing remarks from you? So, um, generally, yeah, so I mean, I've answered to this uh, from Dominic. Uh, from my perspective, I don't actually consider micro-credentials to be so revolutionary for most higher education institutions from a content perspective. Your average degree is already modular, and those modules do correspond to specific skills and learning outcomes. Um, depending on the institution, you may have formally expressed those in the documents to a higher or lower detail, but you have them. And it's very rare that you will find a university course that would just be um, Max 1, Max 2, Max 3, Max 4, Max 5. The modules tend to be related to specific skill sets. I think what is more original about the micro-credentialing is that you take the power of universities to be the sole arbiter of which combinations are allowed and which combinations are not allowed. And you widen the market for those combinations from a preset uh, list of maybe 50, 100 modules from one faculty or one department within one institution to saying you can study the modules from anywhere and combine them from anywhere. 
And for me, that is the revolution of the micro credentialing. It's not a content issue. It's a university governance and administration recognition issue. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Right, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Chiara Carlino from Cinica, uh, which, if you don't know, is um, uh, a, a network of Italian universities. And um, Chiara is going to talk, us, talk to us about the work in the um, Open Virtual Mobility Project um, around digital credentials. Thank you, Deborah, and hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here and for being interested in, uh, in this work. Uh, it's been great to have this uh, very high-level introduction by, by Anthony, which really opened up uh, our, our view on what we are going to, uh, on, on the landscape we are looking at when we talk about digital credentials and higher education. Um, r right now, I'm going to tell you about a very specific experience that we are uh, carrying on in the Open Virtual Mobility Erasmus Plus project, uh, which is uh, a very hands-on experience compared to uh, the high-level presentation that we just, uh, high-level reflection that we just um, carried out. So uh, let's see how we are trying to uh, implement and uh, activate with real users, real students, uh, an experiment with the digital credentials, uh, open education, and virtual mobility. The Open Virtual Mobility uh, Erasmus Plus project is a strategic partnership and these are some of its main goals. We are trying to, uh, to work in order to uh, improve the uptake of open virtual mobility uh, to make it uh, more known among the interested uh, users, meaning students, teachers, universities, and we are developing a, a proper virtual mobility learning hub based on Moodle uh, where virtual mobility skills can be achieved, developed, reflected upon, assessed, and finally recognized with digital credentials as we will, um, as we will see. So um, starting from competencies, the very first thing that, that we did in the, in the project was identifying which competencies are useful and needed for virtual mobility? What do students and teachers need to be skilled on uh, to, to enjoy properly virtual mobility experiences? This has been done through um, group work, engaging experts, and we actually identified eight different competencies for virtual mobility. Each of these has its own uh, sub-competencies and what we are currently working on is linking them to the to the main ESCO framework so that we are aligned to, to the main European standard. Uh, the concept here is that for a very specific domain such as that of virtual mobility uh, we found it useful to draw our own framework and then map it to the main ESCO framework instead of uh, instead of selecting from, from that one. If you want to take a look at our competency directory, it is, it is online, it is uh, being worked on uh, still, so you might find, um, uh, yeah, you, you can take a look if you like. There is a link down in the, in the slide. So we, uh, I said eight competencies, and for each competency we identify three levels at which the competency can be developed and mastered. So we created eight for three, 24 mini MOOCs to help students and teachers reflect on this level, on each different level of each different competency, uh, learn more about it, maybe develop the competence, and, uh, and be organized for that. Uh, what you see here, maybe a little small, uh, is a screenshot from our virtual mobility hub uh, based on Moodle, as, a, as I said before, uh, where you can see there are major blocks for each of the eight competencies, and within each block there is, beside the, the welcome part, there are three different mini MOOCs at the three different um, different level. So we have, uh, as, uh, as anticipated, 24 open badges attached to these 24 
uh, mini MOOCs. The mini MOOCs are, of course, built uh, using open educational resources and a variety of open educational tools, which connects back to the definition that Anthony mentioned of open education. We use videos, we use text, uh, we use peer assessment. There are a variety of tools involved. Uh, besides the 24 uh, uh, open badges connected to the specific uh, mini MOOCs, we have one more open badge just for engagement, uh, which is with, with, who, with which we recognize those who have uh, contributed to the development of, of the hub and of the project and of the, the network that is around it. All of these open badges are not hosted directly on Moodle, but they are hosted on the Bester platform, which is developed by Chineka and exists independently from the project. We have made this choice in order to uh, detach also in the eyes of the, of the students, of the learners, but also of the potential readers of these credentials, detach the credentials from the specific learning experience. It's not something that's bound to the learning experience, to the MOOC, to the Moodle environment. It's uh, uh, a credential, it's something that tells something about what uh, the learner has gained, the competency that he showed, that he developed, he or she developed, uh, and this is and should be independent from the specific learning experience so that the reader does not need to go into the details of what program was inside the MOOC, but the digital uh, credential tries to uh, translate what the student has learned in his learning experience into what he, says, what, uh, he or she has acquired in terms of skills. Of course, with uh, complete transparency, uh, relating to uh, how much work that was, what kind of experience that was, and what kind of assessment uh, it was involved. Of course, it, this needs to be uh, very, very clear so that whoever is going to read these credentials can decide how, how much trust and how much value uh, he or she wants to attribute to, um, to the credential that she is reading. Uh, so, uh, there are some questions. Oh, what is the difference between a mini MOOC and a regular MOOC? Just, um, just a side uh, question. Since we are addressing um, specific competencies and we are addressing learners that might be taking these uh, learning experiences independently, we have tried to keep these MOOCs very small. So uh, um, I, don't, I don't really remember. I can't tell you exactly how many hours. Uh, of study they require, but it's written in the in, in the hub. Uh, the point is, we just try to keep it uh, to keep it short, and we prefer the dividing into three different uh, sub MOOCs instead of having one big MOOC for a specific uh, for a specific skill. We prefer the dividing it into the three levels so that um, uh, the learner could also experience. Uh, um, stepping forward, a, a more explicit uh, moving forward experience. Um, the issuing of open badges, both the MOOCs, uh, the ones connected to the MOOCs, and uh, the one that is more the engagement open badge, the, the issuing happens automatically thanks to a two-way integration between the Buster platform and the Moodle-based uh, hub. Uh, of course, uh, the, the criteria uh, upon, uh, upon which the automatic issuing is based are different from the Minimux badges and the contributor badge. The Minimux badges are issued when the learner has completed all the activities um, included in a specific course, learning, assessment, e-portfolio if it is required, peer evaluation if it is required, and so on. When the learner has completed his learning or her learning experience, then uh, the badge is issued. The contributor badge is, is different and asks for, to the learner how he or she contributed to, to the project or the hub, and then um, the badge is issued. I mentioned uh, he, this is the, um, the path. Uh, through which uh, an open badge is, uh, is gained from a learner on the hub. So you can choose uh, um, a, sk 
feel an area at a specific subgroup at a specific level. This is, for example, digital and media literacy. You go through a pre-assessment that is going to suggest which level you should start from, and then you will decide if you are going to start from the foundation, intermediate, or advanced level. And after any assessment, and in some cases also peer activities and portfolio activities, you're going to complete the course and then uh, and then get the badge. I mentioned before a two-way integration between uh, the Moodle Hub and the Bester platform. Uh, on the top of the slide, you see the first way of the integration. Uh, the Moodle uh, Virtual Mobility Hub, Moodle-based Virtual Mobility Hub, has a specific plugin um, which allows an experience API statement to be sent on course completion. And it is sent where? To a learning record store which is hosted on Bester. So Bester knows which learning experiences a learner has passed through and when the learning experiences are complete, in this case on, upon course completion, uh, the platform is going to issue the, the related open badge to the learner. On the other way around, uh, the Virtual Mobility Hub is also able to read from Bester uh, the open badges that have been issued to the different learners through specific APIs that the Bester platform uh, exposes. This allows the Moodle Hub to uh, express this information in a very handy version for the learner so that the learner can have, for, uh, for example, this board where I can see uh, lighten up the, the badges that I already own and grade up uh, the badges that I still don't own with the link to the course that is going to allow me to have that specific badge. This is one more way that we provide to students to get the learning experience that they want or, or need, not only the, by, by browsing the, the free of the available MOOCs. Oh, thank you, Deborah, for sharing the, the link to the Virtual Mobility Hub. Uh, so, uh, how we're going uh, so far? We have issued over 1,200 open badges for the project. Um, we, we had, and this is actually um, a count uh, made there at, at the end of November, if I remember correctly. Uh, we had over 600 users visiting Open Virtual Mobility Badges on Bester. Um, this is relevant and different because uh, the 1,000 or more issued Open Badges for sure impact the learner who received these badges. Uh, the 600 users who are visiting the OpenVM Badges on Bester are separate users and are not necessarily all students. They might be readers, other students, teachers, uh, other people who uh, have for some reason been interested in watching and uh, reading the, the digital credential issues to specific, to specific users. We are also carrying on surveys, quality assurance surveys with the students to understand how they liked this experience of being issued open badges and how useful they, they found they were. Uh, one last thing we are going to experiment in the last month of the project is issuing only to advanced level students for advanced level sub -MOOCs, also a block search format for, um, for, this, uh, dig for the digital credentials. So not only open badges, but also the block search, just for an experiment to see uh, how they are received and how they might work for, um, for the students. Uh, of course, uh, we are encouraging students to do something with the badges that they gain, share them on social networks, display them in the portfolio. Also, there is a Mahara instance included in the OpenVM hub, so they are encouraged to, to add the open badge there. They can add it to their LinkedIn profile, they can add it to their digital resume, and you know, all things that can usually be done uh, with, um, with an open badge, and we hope that the fact that they are hosted on um, a separate and independent platform uh, is useful mostly for the readers who is, uh, doesn't need to go into a, a, a Moodle instance to see what the student is showing, what competence the student is, uh, is showing. 
Uh, here are, is an example of uh, OpenVM, open badges embedded uh, on LinkedIn or, or on Mahara. And that's basically it. This is the partnership working on the Open Digital Mobility Erasmus Plus project. Um, thank you for listening until now. Um, available for any questions. Thank you very much, Chiara. I think it's very useful. Um, yes, and uh, Ferenc has uh, the question that I was um, uh, wondering myself, which is how do you see the relation of open badges and digital micro-credentials? Oh, well, open badges can be a tool to, to make, to do, uh, to do micro-credentialing. Uh, I think very often the discussion on um, digital credentialing, micro-credentials, uh, skills on one hand, uh, learning experience on the other hand, uh, get a bit confused by mixing uh, purposes and, um, and tools. So open badges are a technical tool to express something, to, to describe a competence, to, re to recognize a competence to a learner, to express the criteria upon which this recognition has happened. Um, just a tool, no more, no less than a PDF, for example. This specific uh, features that a PDF maybe doesn't have, which are verifiability, machine readability, the possibility to have uh, specific metadata, and so on. So micro-credentialing, meaning for this, uh, the practice of releasing micro uh, small pieces of recognition in order for the to allow the students to build a bigger piece of uh, of recognition by stacking them this is a practice that can be enabled using open badges it can also be enabled using other kinds of digital credentialing it's a matter of understanding which specific features we need uh, to enable this kind of, of ecosystem, as, as Anthony was talking, was saying before. I, I don't know if I uh, met your... Okay, was that um, answer satisfactory, Fred? Uh, I'd like to come back to um, uh, the question from Beatrice earlier. What is the workload for every mini MOOC? Can you get any ECTS combining several of the mini MOOCs? Uh, you said that the workload was not the priority, that it was uh, uh, more developing the, the competence was the, was the priority. But I think this is also one of the issues that we have with ECTS, is that for the moment they are expressed in terms of workload. So, um, sorry, I, I probably expressed myself uh, incorrectly. Uh, there is a known workload for, uh, for each minimum. I just don't remember how much it is. Uh, at this moment, but if you go to the to the hub, you can see how much work is expected for each uh, for each minimum. As for getting ECTS, that uh, is not something that uh, um, a Moodle-based hub can do. It's something that a university can do. So each university can decide if they're going to recognize ECTS credits for the work done and demonstrated on the hub. And uh, I know that. Some of the partners of the project are actually doing that because they're incorporating the MOOCs into their, their actual programs and connecting the work done by students on the hub with their proper program. Okay, thanks. thanks for that, Chiara. Yeah, um, and to make the link with um, what uh, Anthony said earlier as well about the ECHO project, um, the ECHO project is actually going to be looking at the OpenVM mini MOOCs to see the extent to which they align with the requirements for the digital credentials that ECHO is working on. Um, and so we're hoping to do that, I say we because I'm involved in OpenVM and in, and in ECHO, um, hoping to, um, to get the feedback from that into OpenVM before the project finishes. So it's a bit of a race uh, because ECHO has just started and OpenVM is coming uh, towards the towards the end, uh, with about six months left to, to run, I think. Uh, but hopefully there'll there'll be that interaction uh, between the two uh, projects, so that will also um, help answer uh, Beatrice's question about uh, 
uh, the actual recognition level of these. But I think, if I understand correctly, the philosophy behind um, open virtual mobility, um, the competencies, is that they are support competencies to support and, and foster um, open virtual mobility. But they could very well be recognized by institutions um, as, as, as part of a wider qualification or in uh, recognizing that competency in itself. OK, yeah, thank you very much good. for that. Uh, so um, Beatrice is going to have a closer look at the hub. And I think uh, there is time for any more questions coming in through the chat, if people have them, or comments. Um, and uh, otherwise, I'll ask the uh, colleagues in the secretariat to switch to our third and final presentation from Pete Hendricks from EADTU, the European Distance Education, Distance Education, European Distance Teaching Universities. Yeah, first, European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. There we go. I've got it. OK. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Um, so um, I speak not only on behalf of uh, ADTU, but also uh, the European MOOC Consortium we created, and I say something about it, uh, because uh, we are working on, on, on several sites uh, for developing micro-credentials uh, for formal education only. That's our scope for the moment. Uh, we don't speak about non-formal and not about informal education. Uh, and in the sphere of continu continuing education. So our focus in this work was on uh, adult students, uh, let's say 25 plus uh, years old students. And I oh, need to change. So also the European Book Consortium. And yeah, perhaps for those who don't know, AEDTU is, is uh, an organization of uh, uh, the European Open Universities uh, and of some 200 traditional universities which are a member of our national associations that organize um, distance education uh, for adult students mainly. So that's, that's our EDTU uh, association and now the, the European MOOC consortium is consisting of the uh, big platforms uh, in Europe at, the, at this moment. Others can come in when they are there. There are not so many platforms, MOOC platforms in Europe. That's FutureLearn. FutureLearn is owned by the British Open University uh, and now also co-owned by an Australian, it's perhaps important to say, an, an Australian organization which is called SEEK and it's uh, focusing on the labor market in many countries in Southeast Asia. Then the second organization is France Université Numérique, is uh, belonging to the French Ministry of Education, Higher Education as an agency. Uh, Meriada X is uh, um, uh, from is, is Spanish and uh, uh, it's organized by Telefonica, which is semi-public, uh, semi-private uh, company for telecommunication. Uh, AD Open is an association of 20, no, about 30 now, 30 Italian universities. Um, it's a MOOC platform for these universities organizing MOOCs, in most cases in Italian, and Open Abad is a, is a portal which from the beginning of the MOOCs movement, movement was organized by EDU, 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 EDU itself. And so what I will present today is work which uh, originated, uh, which is developed in, in the European MOOC Consortium. But the idea, the idea of creating micro-credentials was not only coming from the MOOC Consortium, it was also coming from our membership in the European Association of Business Teaching Universities, because most of the programs organized in our association are degree programs, uh, bachelor and master degrees. And of course, the time horizon of students who are at work, it's much shorter than uh, yeah, six years when you do really a bachelor. Yeah, you do 
perhaps a part-time part -time study, so that means twice, three years for a bachelor, six years, uh, yeah, or, or a little bit less perhaps, but not very much less. Uh, and so for many students, this is uh, really a time horizon which is too wide, too, too far. And therefore, the idea uh, emerged as well uh, in, the, in the EDTU to organize short learning programs that will deliver as well um, uh, 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 micro credentials. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the aim of EMC, I, I don't go uh, far into it, but of course, it's also uh, uh, having an impact really uh, on educational policy and also on the employability of, of learners uh, in Europe or worldwide um, and uh, the, the European MOOC consortium increased the credibility and visibility of uh, all uh, MOOC platforms for achieving this. Um, yeah, I, I, I should not explain this very much, but uh, um, yeah, you have, you have a degree, but it's not like in, in, in former times that when you have a degree that you don't need any more upskilling and reskilling uh, for your competences. Uh, that's now very much needed, also because of uh, longer and, 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 uh, and rapidly changing careers. Uh, there's another example for this. But what we have also observed uh, just a couple of years ago, it was not difficult to observe, it was published by by uh, Open Classroom, I believe. You see uh, a lot of uh, micro-credentials uh, for, delivered for, awarded for MOOCs uh, with, with different names, nano degrees, uh, uh, micro-masters, uh, and, and, and so on. So by different uh, American MOOC platforms mainly. And all these degrees, they, they were very, they, they, all these micro-credentials were very diverse uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the time you need uh, to, to achieve these micro-credentials and the uh, workload effort and also uh, the qualification levels. So really there is no, there was not any consistency in, in these uh, micro-credentials delivered nowadays uh, by MOOC platforms so far, uh, mainly American uh, MOOC platforms. So therefore, we thought it's really very much needed to develop a kind of European common micro-credential framework for uh, MOOCs, for MOOC-based programs, but also at the same time for the short learning programs I mentioned, uh, uh, which are organized by the open universities and the distance teaching universities, traditional universities that organize shorter programs. And so what we did actually is to develop a common micro-credential framework, which is different, of course, uh, from micro-credentials uh, or certificates delivered uh, from companies or the private sector. What we deliver is university-based, university micro-credentials. And there are some requirements, strong requirements for these micro-credentials. The first one is that, that it is about accredited courses. Accredited perhaps in the framework of another program, but the courses should be accredited or at least the university should be accredited. Uh, institutionally, there should be a rigorous, a rigorously, uh, a rigorous assessment. A rigorous assessment. There should be, they should be also standardized. They should be uh, transferable, stackable. All these notions you have heard already from um, former speakers. And they they should form. This is uh, a pathway into other uh, qualifications. It can be a bachelor, it can be a master as well, but we have always uh, had the scope of continuing education only. And I can explain further why, but um, I continue now first this presentation. And we see also in other countries, um, um, male, uh, other countries qualifications um, uh, uh, emerging, uh, not just in New Zealand, also in Canada, and uh, in other parts of the world, I talk also about uh, Australia. Uh, so that's that's just also a trend, and always in this same sphere of uh, uh, continuing education as part of higher education systems. 
So, um, what was the ambition of the European MOOC Consortium with these micro-credentials? Uh, yeah, we wanted to have a shared definition of a micro-credential. A shared uh, definition of a micro-credential. Uh, as a new qualification, a micro-credential for us is a new qualification uh, to address the needs of employers and learners looking for smaller units of study and that develop relevant competences, I would say now, uh, skills, competences. You see, uh, languages are something some, sometimes different, um, but competences, is, competence is the most appro appropriate uh, wording, I think. Um, enable also courses to be recognized towards formal qualifications, bachelor, masters, uh, uh, eventually. Enable courses to be stackable across different higher education systems in Europe and, and beyond. Um, and uh, so when we have developed this, we hoped also to see this framework used more widely by European universities and agencies to facilitate the collaborations. So th this was the ambition and then uh, we have developed something uh, very concrete, I think. Uh, so for us, the new qualification we offer, and you can also see that uh, on, on some websites, I, I, uh, I have, to, I, I have a, a link in this in this presentation later on. Um, so the total workload for this qualification is between 100 hours and no more than 150 hours. That means, and that's based on, on research actually in, in our membership, so adult students, have, if they are really studying intensively, you don't, you can't request much more than eight hours study a week. And so it's really substantial when a student takes uh, 100 to 150 hours. That means uh, 15 weeks or 20 weeks. So that's quite something. And I think on, basis of, on this basis, you deserve really this new qualification, which will then be between four and six ECTS. And ECTS points will be indeed uh, attached to such a micro credential, to this new qualification. And also we make a link, we, we, we make the link really, uh, with, with the competences as defined uh, in the European qualification framework. So it should be higher education level. That's what we wanted to say, but we need also that European qualification framework to indicate what really the level is. Is it a bachelor, bachelor level course? Is it a, a master level course? Or is it even a third a cycle level course? So that must be very clear because in, in many current um, micro-credentials and certificates and all kinds of awards, uh, given by universities, you don't know what you what you get as an employer, uh, and also you don't know what you get as an as a university when when you have to give access or admission uh, for uh, for some students to uh, a master degree programs or a doctorate. Even there must be a, really a summative assessment uh, that enables the award of. ECTS, an academic credit. Um, and of course, uh, but the assessment is really key. Uh, if there is no real, real good summative assessment, acceptable assessment, valid assessment, reliable assessment, then of course, such a qualification has not any value. If there is no uh, really uh, professional assessment, then you can better stop with issue of micro-credentials in a formal education context. And so this is really very important. Or at least you should make sure, and, and that's referring to some uh, educational system like in, in Finland, for example, you have to make sure that all the data are there uh, to recognize the micro-credential in the framework of recognition of prior learning uh, when a student would enroll on a, a further uh, course at the university. And uh, connected with this assessment, yeah, they should also demonstrate which 
I did, I did recently in, in the case of online courses and MOOCs or online, uh, which reliable method of ID verification is used at the point of assessment. So that's really these are strong requirements. And the last one, the last but not least, at which would, I would say is that it also provides a transcript for the learning outcomes or the competences for the MOOC in terms of total study hours required, the competence levels, EQF level, and the number of credits, credit points earned. And in the European context, uh, yeah, uh, there are some differences. So we have talked here still about learning outcomes. We know that also uh, some universities are starting to use uh, uh, the ESCO system competence uh, based. Uh, well, um, we see that in many universities, they combine both. They speak about learning outcomes and then when defining their learning outcomes, they define also the the competences certainly when it is, is in terms of uh, description of MOOCs. Um, and the, my last slide, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other design parameters for micro credentials under the common micro, micro credential framework. So you can imagine that when you have uh, a course of, or a program, a MOOC based program of 150 hours. There are, it consists of, of more than one MOOC. There are more MOOCs, but it should be organized in such a way that it's really uh, affordable uh, for students, manageable for students around their busy lives. Um, and also, yeah, because of this public, of, uh, of, uh, of this audience of working students, students at work, uh, we uh, emphasize that um, yeah that there should be a balance between theory and and, and practice um, yeah uh, although we must be sure that ECTS points can be awarded huh? so primarily these are academic programs academic uh, books yeah? but relevant for the workplace. That's very much connected with the other aim of uh, the European MOOC Consortium to be indeed relevant for the workplace, relevant for for uh, working people, work, uh, relevant for the for the economy, which might be a little bit different when you when you would organize a, a bachelor degree or a master degree at um, for mainstream students. Um, yeah, uh, next steps, extending practices with this common micro-credential framework, with this definition of, uh, of a micro-credential in the European MOOC platforms. And you can see that already in the, in the future, learn, future, future Learn programs, but also the other MOOC platforms are now uh, uh, introducing this qualification, this qualification at the, in the common micro-credential framework uh, for their micro credential programs, for their MOOC based programs. And at the other end, within the EDTU, we are now discussing the, uh, how to implement the common micro credential framework in short learning programs. Uh, short learning programs, so learning programs which are less than a bachelor, but, but stackable to a bachelor as well, uh, how, how they can be introduced in these uh, short learning programs. And then, of course, uh, we are in a continuous dialogue on the future of micro credentials at the policy level uh, to further uh, our ambitions. As you see, that's, that's it, I think. As you see, it's, uh, a, it's it, the scope is really uh, an academic scope, formal learning. And uh, yeah, uh, we were focusing on, on uh, continuing education. Uh, out of experience, and uh, I repeat this, and that we can have once a very nice discussion about this, it's, I think, easier to introduce the notion of micro-credential framework in the lifelong learning uh, framework than in uh, mainstream uh, educational programs. Because imagine that you, and that that's the problem actually, 
when you deliver every time a micro credential after each unit of uh, study uh, um, consisting of the development of sub competences. Um, yeah, uh, students might be content with uh, two or three micro credentials and then leave or stop studies and so on. Um, uh, what we see is rather that uh, universities and also policymakers are very much concerned about um, uh, really a regular study progress and study success so that most of the students after three years, I speak about mainstream stu students, um, uh, get their bachelor, uh, which is in, in many countries not the case at this moment. And this is really a problem in terms of economic loss for the student. Uh, so the loss of one year study for a student uh, means for the student individual cost about 50,000 euros, and uh, you should calculate this uh, from a macroeconomic point of view. Also a cost for the, for the university, and also a general um, cost uh, for society, and that's only the cost aspect. And so that's why I think uh, for the moment, um, universities will, uh, will, will be very much reluctant to deliver other qualifications uh, then uh, first degrees, which are bachelor degrees, or second degrees, which are master degrees. But that's a point we, a discussion we can have. So, thank you very much. And if you have questions, I am listening. Thank you very much, Pete, for that uh, very nice and um, easy to understand example of what the European MOOC Consortium is doing. Um, and then for taking us up to this wider question of um, whether or not universities will be, whether it's in their interest um, to develop micro-credentials, whether they will have to react. Um, and um, uh, we have a, a provocative question here, or a question in the chat from Anthony, our, one of our other co-presenters. Um, if you'd like to have a look at it and then um, uh, see how we can take this forward. Mm. Uh, mm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's. It, I, I think the European MOOC uh, platform um, is 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 working only with established uh, accredited. Universities. So at this moment, in total, the, the MOOC consortium is working with more than 400 uh, European universities, uh, more than 3,000 MOOCs already, and 16 million learners. So that's the situation at this at this moment. Um, it, it's not an exclusive uh, qualification. An exclusive qualification is, for example, what. MicroMasters are for edicts in the US. That's exclusive. You can't organize uh, a MicroMaster outside of edicts when you are not belonging to that uh, network of, uh, of edicts. So that's not what we aim at. No, uh, we, I think the, 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 the micro credential, the micro credential framework, the common micro credential framework is open to any accredited European university, but, but at the other hand, you have seen the requirements. And, uh, there, should, there are some requirements uh, which will be safeguarded. And uh, the, at this moment, there is not yet an organization for organizing this. And at this moment, this, these uh, micro-credentials and the common micro-credential framework are only delivered uh, by the MOOC platforms. Uh, yeah, but we are in, in, in a way to, to um, we are uh, underway to, um, um, to, uh, yeah, to license this or to, to take a license on this, a European license. And uh, so the, the logo of the European, uh, of the, the Common Market Financial Framework will be, um, will be protected. Uh, and, um, it's true, uh, 
we have to 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 um, to ensure the quality of this qualification and uh, the universities that want to issue want to award in the future uh, this micro credential this but this micro credential they have to fulfill some conditions and the conditions are are uh, yeah they are strict requirements and but they are not nothing more than what I have presented today so they are logical conditions in the framework of formal higher education and formal higher higher education and formal degree education and so on. so it should um, I think this micro credential framework sh should be should be able um, to be integrated in uh, the degree structure of the Bologna process that that's that's the aim and then you and then you need then you need to to meet uh, some okay thank you for that I just wanted to say we can hear your colleagues around you but we did also get your uh, <laughs> your, uh, yeah, yeah. your argument there um, Anthony is there any reaction that you you have to that there was a question coming in and then I think our participant um, decided perhaps not to share it but uh, so I'll hand over to you Anthony was there, did you want to react to what people um, uh, no particular no particular reaction I mean I do wonder five to ten years down the line what our definition of an accredited university is going to look like if micro credentials grow significantly. Um, okay, I come from a very, very small member state, which is Malta, and we're already uh, accrediting, uh, UA, <laughs> accrediting higher education institutions that basically only offer one or two modules of 10 ECTS. And that is, let's say, already possible under the legislation in my home country. And uh, yeah, yeah. I think we might see that growing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just while discussing, one of the things I wonder as well is if micro-credentials uh, uh, will have an effect on the hybridization of vocational versus higher education. So especially when you're looking at level six and level seven vocational education and the fact that that's very linked to the workplace, I think that, let's say, it will become harder and harder to distinguish the difference between the vocational and the higher uh, education module when you actually break it down to the micro-credential mm -hmm. level. Um, uh, and I think in policy discussions, mm -hmm. when we start looking at things and saying, listen, uh, should we use ECTS, which, by the way, I strongly, strongly support, I think there'll be some interesting discussions to have around this vocational higher disconnect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, uh, my answer to, to this is that uh, when vocational uh, training is delivering, delivering awards, uh, qualification, uh, vocational qualification, without ECTS, uh, because they are not able to deliver ECTS points, then still uh, they, they can be, uh, and they are, I think, in many universities in Europe, uh, recognized uh, mm. by uh, the procedure of uh, prior learning. Uh, so it, it's really, it's, it's, it's already possible. And then, um, yeah, uh, uh, of course, in, in other countries, like in Belgium, uh, I am, as you know, I am from Belgium, um, in our legislation, it's perfectly possible to organize uh, micro-credential programs also for mainstream students, but I don't see universities doing this. Uh, so, uh, actually, universities can make any program uh, because, because uh, a, 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 a students can be registered even at the course level. Uh, so, that makes it possible. And, 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 uh, and uh, uh, even universities are funded uh, for each course delivered. So, in principle, it's possible. But I think they are very reluctant because they, just for the reasons I told you, um, perhaps they, they would adopt a, a modular structure, but always uh, bringing you know, uh, students uh, to a bachelor degree in three years' time or to a master degree in two years' time. And that's the big, that's a, at the moment uh, the big challenge in, in our universities, in, in our in Flemish universities, for example, which uh, have a very, very flexible uh, system uh, from the uh, from the, the legal point of view. So the, the, everything is possible, but you see that they are reluctant to do so if it is not in the sphere of competition. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I think, uh, yes, this uh, encourages us to uh, 
uh, keep uh, up to date, keep ahead of the game as much as we can, um, looking for these um, links and looking for the implications um, at a wider uh, economic and societal level of, uh, of what micro-credentials actually mean and how they, how they will impact things. Um, I could discuss this topic for hours and hours. Um, I have questions about assessment and so on, but uh, uh, we are coming to um, towards the end of the webinar, and I do have to leave um, at half past one um, immediately because then I have to rush off to get a train. Um, so uh, if participants have questions, then feel free to um, put them in the chat. I would like to thank our uh, three speakers and Ildiko in the background um, for sharing these very different perspectives on what's going on in Europe. Um, as we have um, participants from outside Europe, it would be very, very interesting to develop these conversations further. As Pete mentioned, um, there's a lot going on um, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Canada, um, and we'd love to hear from other parts of the world as well. So um, um, what I can, um, I can see thanks coming in, informative. Um, what I can ask the uh, Secretariat to do is maybe to collect um, all the links that we've uh, 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 shared in the chat and maybe share a document with people um, who've um, uh, participated. Um, I'd also like to let you know that uh, we have two um, events on tomorrow. I'm going to put these in the Oh no, the Secretariat has already done it. Uh, we are, uh, so we have two events tomorrow. Um, we have Open Education Technologies at 1 o'clock uh, CET, and we also have Open Education for Civic Engagement and Democracy. Uh, so what we're doing with this webinar series is really uh, taking a whole lot of different angles on open education within the framework of Open Education Week. And then Please. finally, um, just to repeat the invitation to you all to come and join us at the Eden Annual Conference in Timisoara in June. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. Today. Have a lovely Thanks. afternoon or morning bye -bye. or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you've got bye the link too.